So we're going to do a very special question show today. Uh, it's been James Webb week here on my channel, and so we're just going to keep that theme going. Uh, we did a 20 plus minute episode all about the past and future of James Webb. It was a monster episode, one of the most complicated ones we've ever done. So I hope you enjoyed that. The same day that we released that, I got to interview Paul Geithner, who is the deputy project manager uh, from NASA for James Webb. And we talked, just went into detail, answered people's questions, spent an hour talking about the telescope those two episodes plus a bunch of stuff beforehand generated a pile of questions and now i'm going to answer them here so hopefully at this point this will hold everybody over until the telescope actually launches uh in march 2021 um and if anything changes i'll keep you posted all right let's get into these new questions chris barlow how will James Webb be powered? Is there any way to possibly extend its operational time? We talked about this a bit in my interview with, uh, with Paul, but uh, James Webb is powered with electricity, solar panels. So it's going to be able to use the power of the sun to operate its instruments, electronics, run its reaction wheels. Uh, so it's going to use that as it's ongoing. And that's renewable and so it'll never run out of electricity unless the solar panels degrade. But the other part, the part that will get used up is the fuel that it uses for station keeping to remain at the L2 Sun Earth Lagrange point. You know, it's a it's a place that is meta unstable, which means that it is going to slowly drift away from this location and require more and more fuel to keep itself perched back there. And officially Right, James Webb has a five-year um, first mission. It probably has enough, or it, it it almost certainly will have enough fuel on board for about ten years. And as Paul mentioned in the interview that we did, if it goes perfectly, um, <clears throat> where uh, it makes every burn as efficiently as possible, it could maybe extend out to about seventeen years of fuel until it drifts away and it won't be able to do any more work. Now, it has the ring that will be clamped onto the top of the upper stage of the Ariane 5 rocket that it's going to launch on. So that could be used as a hard point that any future uh, refueling mission could go to. It also has the uh, fuel intake valve that will will be used to fuel up the telescope when it's sitting on top of the rocket. So again, these are two resources that a future mission could do to actually refuel it. And we'll get into that in, in the next question. Kimber. Northrop Grumman has their maintenance vehicles, MEVs, they're now flying. I'm surprised to have heard so little about it, but I wonder if it could be leveraged if JWST has issues like Hubble did. Unlike Hubble, there are no service vehicles or crews available for it otherwise. I think this is one of the advantages of 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 the delay. I guess you know, it's billions of dollars over budget and years delayed. But if we're going to make some lemonade from those lemons, one is just that the technology of orbit orbital servicing um, maintenance has advanced significantly. There's a lot more done in space now. There's experiments on board the International Space Station to practice refueling satellites in space. Uh, SpaceX is going to be developing a bunch of technology to refuel the SpaceX Starships. They're using technology from NASA to be able to do this. So there are a lot more technological advances that have come out in these delaying times that may offer a ray of hope. And so you can imagine some future spacecraft that is designed to grab onto that docking clamp that I mentioned, a uh, very standard size, be able to uh, deliver fuel into its fuel port. And that could then offer years, decades more of lifetime for the spacecraft. And so it Although there are no official plans, it's not in the works, nobody set aside any budget with the advancing technology. It really seems incomprehensible to me that as James Webb is starting to run down, that they won't launch a mission for even a couple of billion dollars that would refuel the satellite and keep it going for decades more. It's it's just that nobody has has definitively said that that's a thing they're going to do. But as as the lifetime of James Webb starts to run out, it does seem possible. It seems like a thing that you would want to do to maintain that investment for the long term. 
EL. Because of the sun shield, James Webb can only see half, probably a bit more of the sky. So doesn't that mean that we should have built it on the moon where it could be cheaper and maybe even fixable if a problem would occur, like with the Hubble Space Telescope? What am I missing? What you're missing is the fact that James Webb with the Earth is in orbit around the sun. So as I mentioned, at L2, the Sun, Earth, L2 Lagrange point, which is about uh, 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth, farther out from the Earth, the Sun, Earth and Moon are all located in the same spot of the sky. Now, if the Earth didn't orbit around the Sun, then yeah, part of the sky would be permanently unviewable because the Sun is blinding that region. But what happens, of course, and we get this normally, is that as the Earth goes around the Sun, the constellations that are blocked by the Sun change. You know, your zodiac sign, I'm a Leo, means that the Sun was in Leo when I was born. But other times of the year, the sun will be in different constellations. And the same thing will be true for James Webb. So over the course of a year, it will have the entire sky visible to it. And this is not the case if you put it on the moon. If you put the telescope on the southern pole of the moon in one of those permanently shadowed craters, the, the, it'll be able to see essentially the southern skies as it goes around the, the sun, but it will never be able to see the northern skies because the moon will be blocking it permanently. So in fact, being at the L2 point is a much more useful orbit for being able to see as much of the sky as possible. Saquist. Fraser, can James Webb see into the zone of avoidance on the other side of the galaxy? It's interesting to me how some of these ideas like the zone of avoidance or the great attractor, even though these were issues decades ago, a lot of them have been largely solved, right? The zone of avoidance is this region at the where it, essentially through the middle of the galaxy near the core of the galaxy where the gas and dust that surrounds the core blocks the light from a visible light telescope. And so you just you can't see what's going on on the other side. But you can see through it in other wavelengths like radio and with infrared. And astronomers have done this thanks to the Spitzer Space Telescope, which could see mid and far infrared, as well as the Herschel telescope, they've been able to probe through that gas and dust and map out what's on the other side of the zone of avoidance. And it's a big galaxy cluster. And that is the great attractor and you know, all the galaxies in our area are sliding towards this over density of mass that's that's in our region. And we're part of that. And it happens to just be on the other side of the galaxy where we couldn't see it in the past, but we can see it now. Now, James Webb is an infrared observatory. And one of those things that infrared lets you do is see through gas and dust. So James Webb will actually be a great instrument to assist with seeing things that would normally be obscured by that gas and dust at the center of the of the Milky Way. So like on the one hand, the zone of avoidance is no longer the zone of avoidance. The great attractor is no longer that much of a mystery. Um, and yet James Webb is actually a great tool for being able to probe that part of the of the sky. Paul Cockerell. Is the delay a blessing in disguise in that it may now be possible to service it using the new deep space capsule when needed? Had it been launched 10 years ago, by the time the new deep space capsule was ready, James Webb might have already died and been beyond repair. I talked a bit about repair and, and some of the new possibilities that have come up, but I wanted to sort of extend this idea and, you know, maybe try to make a little more lemonade from the dramatic over budget and dramatic uh, longer time frame that's gone on here, which is that all the other astro astronomical advances have pushed forward so far that in fact, the kinds of targets that James Webb is going to be going after the kinds of questions that it's going to be answering are different than what it would if it had launched say 10 years ago. Like think about planets. Now there are 4000 extrasolar planets when 10 years ago, there were only a handful. And so now and, and when James Webb does launch, maybe there'll be 5000 6000 10,000. And there will be many more really interesting candidates that it could be used to look at. And that's just one example. There are lots of other infrared observatories here on Earth that have peered in through gas and dust and see newly forming planetary systems. There are more surveys for dark matter and dark energy. And so James Webb is going to be able to assist in all of these 
worlds in all of these different fields at a more advanced state than it would have a lot longer ago. So it's sort of like astronomers had to be really resourceful because they didn't have this telescope at their disposal. And so they opened up a whole bunch of new questions. And then James will be able to come along and help answer them. And I and I think that I'm, I'm very interested to see what those questions and what those answers will be because James Webb when it does launch, you know, the clock is ticking, it's a 10 year timeline. And then that window shuts down unless they service it. And so the question is like, if you could look at the universe with this very specific, very powerful tool for only 10 years, when would you want to be able to have that 10 years to look? Would you want it to be right at the beginning when you only had a couple of exoplanets to choose from? Or would you want it to have it now or even into the future when there will be tens of thousands of exoplanets to take a look at? You only get 10 years. When do you want that 10 years? And I think it's kind of interesting that that even though it is delayed and it is over budget, one of the side benefits is that now there are there are more interesting targets that James Webb can be used on. So uh, again, enjoy this this lemonade that I'm making. Deepak Singh. Wow, the most complicated piece of science and I'm super worried and NASA is placing this instrument in a place where repairs are not possible. What are they thinking? What are the chances that something may go wrong after launch? What to do then? Why take such a monumental risk? NASA can launch the James Webb first to lower Earth orbit, make sure that everything works fine, and then slowly push it to Sun Earth L2 Lagrange point. You are describing technical risk, right? That that in an undertaking this project, NASA knew that there were going to be new technologies, new issues that were going to cause risk, they needed to make the biggest possible observatory that they could. That's the 6.5 meter, they needed to cool it down with this gigantic tennis court sized sunshade, and they needed to make the whole thing fit inside of a standard rocket fairing of about five meters. And so the whole thing has to fold and for the whole thing to fold, actuators have to be used and release mechanisms have to go off and the whole thing has to work in one fell swoop. And to then at another level, which is like, say, let's launch it first to low Earth orbit, let's open it up and make sure everything works, and then move it out to the L2 point adds another level of complexity. And right now there is no way to repair it, fix it, upgrade it, uh, refuel it, any of that. And so um, having this time where you test it out in, in low Earth orbit first, wouldn't really provide you with any benefit. Because if you did have a problem, there would be no way to fix it anyway. And so you launch it out to L2, unfurl everything, and hope it works. And that is that is uncertainty that is taking risks that is pushing the boundaries into new areas. And it can be fair to say and I, I guarantee there were conversations at NASA, where people were saying, this is too much risk. And other people were saying, these are risks that we should take. And the only way that we're going to know if these were risks worth taking is after the fact, when it all goes through and the telescope does or does not do what it's supposed to do. And, and we won't know until it's all done. And then hindsight will be 2020. Sina Farhat. Based on the time that it took to build it, would it be possible to use all the data and knowledge that we have to build another copy of James Webb using the original estimated budget? If James Webb fails on the launch pad or fails to unfurl in space, then yeah, you could build a copy for less money. Now you're still going to have all of the hard physical costs, but you will have all of the blueprints you will have gone through, you know, you will have known what all of the risks were so you could build a copy and you could lower the cost, not an enormous amount like you couldn't get it for say a billion dollars, but it would be it would be less. But I don't think NASA would do that. They have other priorities, other telescopes in the works, other future observatories that are coming down the line, new uh, challenges that they want to overcome, and they wouldn't turn around and respend that money to launch that telescope. All that other money is accounted for into the far future. It might be they'll come back around in 10 years, 20 years and go, okay, we want to answer those questions about the early universe and exoplanets and all that stuff. Does James Webb make the most sense based on the current suite of instruments that we have at our disposal today? And the answer might be no, but the answer might be yes. And if the answer is yes, then they could build another copy. So right now, the plan is to not fail. Avi's gotten flower. What could JWST see through gravitational lensing? Will it ever use that technique? 
We talked about this idea of gravitational lenses with the Hubble Space Telescope and how many of its greatest discoveries, seeing galaxies forming 500 million years after the Big Bang, were done through gravitational lensing, where you've got this gigantic galaxy cluster up front, then you've got one galaxy that is perfectly aligned, and the galaxy cluster and its dark matter acts like a natural lens to let us see this galaxy that is farther away. And there's only so many of those that are out there in space, and it's incredibly lucky. And that when James Webb comes along, it will be able to just directly observe these things. It'll directly observe these galaxies forming 500 million years, wherever it wants to look. And then when it does its deep field survey, like what Hubble did, where it spends 100 hours with every one of its filters, it'll be able to see stuff that's say 250 million years after the Big Bang. And there's no reason to think why it wouldn't be able to use gravitational lenses as well to see even farther back. But then it's going to be the same thing with Hubble where you're, you're you have to get lucky with the gravitational lenses that you need and they have to be able to see something at the right distance. But I'm sure they're going to be looking for those and I can't wait to report on times when they use James Webb with a gravitational lens to act as another telescope to see even farther back in time, closer and closer to the Big Bang. Vegeta AFH. Hey Fraser, will James Webb be used to view the black holes that were recently viewed? The image of the black hole M87, which was done by the Event Horizon Telescope, was this worldwide network of radio telescopes that all aligned at the same time and gathered their data at the same time, and then computers processed that and made a telescope essentially with a baseline, with a size of planet Earth. And the important word that I said there was that they were radio telescopes. James Webb is an infrared telescope, although they're still photons, they're still on the electromagnetic spectrum, they're different kinds of, you know, different wavelengths of photons. And so James Webb can't work with the rest of those telescopes as part of this worldwide network. It would have to be a radio telescope in space to be a part of it. Or the Event Horizon Telescope would have to be a network of infrared telescopes. And then being able to align the wavelengths in infrared is so much more difficult than doing it in radio waves. But I'm sure that James Webb will be used to probe the cores of galaxies that are known to contain supermassive black holes. It was the Hubble Space Telescope that helped astronomers understand that there are these supermassive black holes at the heart of almost every galaxy. And so James Webb will take those observations to the next level. And again, because the light is getting red shifted as these galaxies are moving faster and faster away from us, it will be able to perceive and observe these galaxies that are really far away and, and a lot less evolved than the current state, right? It's, it's going to be looking back in time. And so what will we say be looking at the supermassive black holes and galaxies as they looked a billion years after the Big Bang, as opposed to closer. So um, it will be looking at black holes, uh, but it won't be doing the same work as won't, it can't be part of the Event Horizon Telescope. That's a whole other um, project. It's you. Doesn't this telescope belong to antiquity now the technology is advancing so fast? Should have been in orbit a long time ago. Yeah, it should have been in orbit a long time ago and for a fraction of the price that it's going to cost. But here we are, right? Late and more expensive. But it definitely won't be a technological antiquity. It is bigger by a significant margin than any other space based mid infrared observatory that has ever been launched. You can't do mid infrared astronomy from down here on Earth. You have to do it in space. There's nothing else like it. And at the scale and scope that this telescope is going to be, there is nothing else in the works that will be able to do what it's going to be able to do. So it's definitely not an antiquity. Um, it is going to be a very specific tool for doing this very specific job. Gavin Lang, worth it. Though I can help wonder at the advances in space travel drive system developments that kind of money could provide for. What is better, looking or exploring? Both, I say. I agree that both are important, and I think it's a bit of like a false premise, right? That just because space telescopes happen to be in space and space exploration happens to be in space, that somehow those two things have to pull from the same budget, right? It's like asking, should we build ships for shipping or should we build ships for tourism? Um, they're two completely separate industries. And, and so when you're thinking about how money should be spent, you can kind of look at all the money that gets spent. Um, should 
uh, we spend money on military or should we spend money on science? Should we spend money on cigarettes or should we spend money on space exploration? Should we spend money on takeout pizza or should we spend money on missions to visit asteroids? Um, I, I think that as soon as you fall into this false dichotomy of saying, oh, it's, it's all, if it happens in space, then it must come from the same budget and they all have their own, everything needs to be able to stand up on its own and be, um, be able to justify its existence. And so if we feel that science is valuable, and of course, you know, here we are, you're watching this on the internet, you are enjoying all of the benefits of science, then it, I think it's reasonable to say, if we have a set amount of science budget, where should we spend that science budget? on biological things, on exploration, on high energy physics, things like that. But I think to say, you know, is it better to spend money on roads or is it better to spend money on medicine? Um, they are just like, they're just two different things. So I, so don't make me choose is what I'm saying. Viper 76. Can't wait for James Webb to be operational. We're entering a new and exciting era in science. Can it find a second genesis like vegetation on another planet? Really looking forward to it. So one of the things that James Webb is going to be doing is assisting in the search for biosignatures. And that is, of course, some kind of evidence that there is life on some other planet that is interacting with its environment and producing gases or wavelengths of light that can only be done by life. And one of the most interesting one is this idea of it's called the red edge. And essentially, there is a specific wavelength of red light that is given off by plant life. And we've done a whole video and I'll, I'll link it right here. But it's a very specific wavelength that should be very bright in a very recognizable way. And in fact, James Webb is right in that sweet spot to be the kind of instrument that could help search for this, this very specific wavelength of red light that will be coming from a planet that is covered in photosynthesis. Now, we don't know if there will be such a thing as alien plants, and they'll be doing alien photosynthesis on their alien worlds. Uh, but it's just another thing to look at. And James Webb will be a really good tool for that. Ziliolix. James Webb is a failure. It's not even in space and it's 12 year old technology. We don't know whether the, the telescope is going to be a failure or not until it launches. Now, of course, in the middle of the process, people were saying that about Hubble. Hubble's a failure. And when Hubble launched and it had its problem with its optics, I'm sure those people doubled down and said, see, the thing's a failure. And then they fixed it. And then they have been doing 30 years of amazing productive science with this amazing telescope. And I don't think you would consider Hubble a failure. Maybe you would. You seem like a fairly um, negative person. But um, so we won't know if James Webb was a failure or not, right? People have taken risk to develop this project and it has gone over budget and it has taken longer than it was supposed to. And I'm sure that there is going to be a very in-depth uh, review of all the people that were involved in this and hopefully lessons will be learned. I suspect that companies that were awarded contracts may have a more difficult time being awarded contracts in the future based on things that happened during this uh, development, but it's too early to call it a failure. It's only when everything is said and done, the telescope is launched, we find out what it's capable of, we find out how, whether it unfurled or not, whether that money was well spent or not. And right now, we don't know. Now, it could be, right, that in fact, this is all just a sunk cost fallacy. And, and people are just throwing good money after bad, and they should just stop this project and work on something else. Or it might be that James Webb is going to be the tool that's going to find literally evidence of, of life on other worlds, then would it have been a failure. So we won't know until after it's done. So you're just gonna to have to come along for the ride and see what happens. But you're not one of the ones working on the project. Maybe you are, I don't know. Uh, so I suspect you, you don't have a lot of skin in the game on this one. So, all right. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this week's deep dive into James Webb. We wrapped up all of the outstanding uh, questions that I could find. So hopefully with this trilogy, the episode, the live stream, and this question show, we've got all of your James Webb needs wrapped up. Next step for it to launch. So 
Good luck, James Webb. We can't wait to see uh, the science that you do. We'll see you all next week.